Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming along. Um, this is, I've lost count of which session we're on now. I think it might be eight or eight, eighth or the ninth. Um, and really happy to have here uh, uh, Daniel Wright from a uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He's gonna be giving us um, a, a session on whether we should be using simulation to implement uh, statistics for high stakes decisions. For in instance, when um, all those grades were given out to A-level and GCSE students last year during the pandemic, that was kind of a high stakes decision. And obviously they got it entirely wrong and it was a bit of a disaster. So this is gonna be uh, Dan showing us how we can uh, use simulation prior to these sorts of things in order to uh, uh, improve our decision making. So I'll pass over to Dan now. Um, thanks very much. And uh, I'll be keeping an eye on the chat just if, uh, just in case uh, anyone's got questions and things like that. Thanks very much. Okay, well, great. Thank you for the invite. And it's it's a pleasure to be back even virtually in, in England and in, in the UK and to be part of the a, a BPS math stats and computing section. So I long ago, I was a very active member in that section. So it's a pleasure to, um, to come back to it. Okay, I will, um, I will keep my fingers crossed that each time I press something, it does what it's supposed to do. So please, everybody keep their fingers crossed with me. Okay, that worked. Um, so the, the question, should we use simulation before high stakes decisions? And I think the example Ollie gave is an obvious one where yes, or where the answer is obvious, yes, we should have. We should have known that those grades were gonna come out and not be accurate and also have done a um, some sort of simulation of what the reaction would be by the angry parents and students and university administrators on what was going to happen with that. Uh, it's obvious to this audience, I think, that this would be a method where simulation will be useful um, for a number of reasons. And that one in that it's easier to explain why a particular statistical procedure will mess up um, using simulation than it is to throw out tons of different equations and say, here are, here's why if you know calculus, this won't work out. Well, that's great if they know calculus, but a lot of policymakers won't know calculus, so it's really of very little use unless you, they're just trusting you. And one of the extra themes of today's session will be that it's really not good just to trust statisticians or consultants when they say, do this, it will work, because that's how you tend to get into, into trouble. Okay, I'm gonna talk about two different about two different simulations, both having to do with assessing schools or grading schools or what's called the league tables in, in England, where you set up all these, you know, you say, here's where school X is, here's where school Y is, and you use that with the idea that this will increase parent choice and that that has some sort of good result for you election-wise, which is, I think, one of the main issues for it. Um, and there's lots of problems with that. So I'll talk about a couple of the different components that are used in, in the US, because I, I know more about the US data at this point, but it's worth mentioning, and I'll say this a couple of times through it, that a lot of the statistical work for talking about school grades and measuring the effectiveness of schools really started in the, in the UK with, in particular, in particular Har Harvey Goldstein, who passed away earlier this year, um, so it's, 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 it's something that's a big issue in the UK now also is it's being brought in, it's being brought in in a bunch of other countries also, but it's something as, as I'll show with the quote, he's always been a bit skeptical of. I'm also going to talk about how policies arise. So while I was in, um, in academia for a while, I moved out of academia and worked in government and worked talking with these policymakers and learned very quickly how, how to talk with policymakers, how it's a different issues that they're often discussing and how it can be fairly tricky. Um, so I'll try to convey some of that. And given that I have that experience, if people have questions, please, please ask. Uh, the two different topics I'll be talking about, one is the graduation growth rate. So this is from 
um, high schools or upper schools or what, whatever one, one wants to call it. And in the US, if a high school is graduating a higher percentage of students, that's a good thing. You want to graduate your students. So a lot of the places give extra points on their school evaluations to high schools that graduate a lot of people and also to high schools that are improving their graduation growth rate. So I'll look at an example of the graduation growth rate, a policy and an algorithm embedded in that policy that was being used for that, that they really should have done some sort of simulation for. And I was brought in um, and well, I'll, I, I won't give away too many details. Um, the second one is what's called, particularly in this country, value added models. It's in quotes there, because that's really just marketing hype. If you call something a value added model, then you're presupposing it measures the value added by the individual units, in this case, schools. And as we will see, that's really more marketing than anything to do with reality. Okay. Um, one of the prerequisites for people taking part in these simulations is that you're comfortable using the, um, the software R. So R is um, a good package for this. Other packages could be used, um, but R is good for that. So we'll, so we'll keep with R. Um, it's five o'clock there. People don't like being quiet at five o'clock. So I, I can say the difference between teaching at 8 a.m. and trying to get people to talk versus at 4 p.m. and trying to get people to shut up um, is big. And I'm sure all of you know that who've taught at both ends of that day. Um, and as I've learned more, I try not to fight against. I should say I now teach a four to seven course. And then the four to 5.30, everybody's talking left, right and center. Um, six to seven people are exhausted and done with it. Um, so it's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a smooth U-shaped curve. But I've decided when I do these not to try to fight against that. So please discuss things. Please, if you don't have tons of background noise, feel free to turn your microphones on and just say, Dan, what about this? Because I'm not gonna be able to see everybody's hands go up. Um, we'll also do a few things. We've got about eight people on here, is that? No, 12 people on here. Um, so that should, so I, I was deciding how to deal with discussions. We'll have a couple in, in the next, in, on the next slide where we can just scream out. Uh, we can also use jam boards. Have people used jam boards? Let me move it so I can see more hands. Oh, I just see names, so I can't see hands. Um, you don't have to, to show me your picture if you don't want, but um, have of the people I can see, I can see one thumbs up, two, three, I, I can see some thumbs up. Okay, so people have used jam boards. I had no idea about jam boards. Um, the course I taught last term was great for me learning how to use all these interactive things because it was a student led course and they taught me how to use all these things. So um, that's good. Now, I also am bright enough to know that nobody wants to um, try to copy out a really long URL, URL like that. So let me put it into the chat. Oh, and there's Kimberly Denson, who's the person who taught me how to use Jamboard on the chat. Yes, she uh, she did. So I um, thank you. Okay, so now I want people to turn on their microphones because this will be easiest by letting people scream out where they are to give me an idea of whether people are in the morning or the evening or somewhere in between. So one, two, three, go. Manchester, UK. Thank you. UK. Okay. Roar, loud, scream. Who, where was the person? Vegas. Okay, so from that, I can gather two things. One is that even the people in the UK um, haven't started drinking yet because they're not overly loud or they're not chanting about whatever football game is going on right now. Um, so that's good. Um, good, goodish. Um, but there's people from a few different places. So the next bit, ooh, 
what is your main stats interest? And rather than yell this out, why don't you use the first Jamboard on there? So I put the Jamboard into the chat. Okay, so I'm gonna give a brief five minute introduction to multi-level models. And I'm going to refer to these as value added models, just because in the context of education, this is when they're used. And also while I'm talking about education, education has an advantage that when you're talking with any people from any discipline, they all know a bit about education because you're all in education. You've all gone through years and years of education. You all know about stuff, particularly with higher education. But the statistical issues that I'll be talking about here relate to all sorts of other areas. And um, you know, there, there's nothing magic about the particular content area that I'll be talking about. And so, for example, in this, this first model, what you're looking at is the post score for the individual child, so the end of year score. And you have a pre-score, say before that school year started, and you want to see how well the pre-scores predict the post-scores, but you've got a beta value, the intercept, and that's going to, if you allow that to differ for the different groups, that will be something that allows you to see um, differences among schools. So this is a simple linear regression between one dependent variable and one independent variable with a single subscript I to denote the students. What we can do is we can turn that into a multi-level model by adding a subscript for the schools here denoted J. And we'll also add a variation around the intercept. So we'll have beta naught plus U sub J and sometimes you can see that as people just putting a subscript by the beta naught. Um, here it kind of spells it out a little bit more, a little bit more easily. Sometimes you'll see the u sub j at the end of the equation. Here, putting it with the intercept, it's actually showing variability around. And so what we would do is the beta naught now becomes some sort of central value for the intercept for all the schools, and u sub j is the variation around that. And so the so U sub J says what the variation for the individual schools are, and it's a random variable. And we, it's usually supposed that it's normally, normally distributed with a mean of zero and an unknown standard deviation. <clears throat> and we can estimate the value, from that we can estimate the values that are the best predicted values for the individual schools. These are called the conditional modes, or in this model, the conditional means, because they'd be the same. Okay, so let's look at a, we're gonna, since this is about simulation, we're gonna start with a really, really simple simulation. Um, I'm just gonna create a little toy data set just to show how this works. So you first need to install any packages that you haven't installed, and then you can use require or library, and some people get really nasty if you use require, so I'll use library. And then we'll just make up a toy data set. So I'm gonna say what these are, just so we're all, so it's five o'clock, just to remind people about these things. When we get to later code, I'll, be, I'll skip a little bit more, but we have school will be the values one through 10. So for 10 schools, each repeated 30 times. So we have 10 schools, but 300 values for that school variable. Student, will give them each a unique student number. So one to 300. We'll let the pre-scores be normally distributed with a standard deviation of five. So for this example, all the kids in all the schools start with the same pre-score. So if this was true in reality it, with actual schools, it would be really easy to estimate a whole lot of things. The issue becomes that the pre-scores will differ for among all the different schools. So we know there's a lot of different things that relate to how well students do and so these will vary by where people live, which is particularly for, for, the, younger, for the younger students, um, that's the main determinant of where they're going to school. And then we'll let post scores equal pre-scores plus a little bit of school influence plus its own random variation. And one of the things that's really nice about the package, about a lot of the R packages and a lot of the R functions is that they're all based on a similar sort of structure. Um, so instead of using LM, which is the main function for a simple linear regression or for 
uh, non-multi-level regressions, we use LME, LMER, and we have the same basic format as we would for a simple linear regression. Then we add in that we have the one random variable, so the UI sub J, so we allow the intercept denoted here by one to vary by school, which is where the vertical bar and then school comes in. So I'd say dash, I, that, it's, that's not the right word for that. So that, that, that creates the model. And then the main graphical technique that people like to use for this is um, a caterpillar plot. So this is in a bunch of different libraries or you can write your own and make it a little bit nicer. Um, so in the lattice one, you just put dot plot, then R-A-N-E-F, which is for the, the random variables. And this is what you would extract the, U, the estimates of the UI sub J from. Um, and this gives you what's called a caterpillar plot. And it shows the individual best estimate for the individual schools and a bar around that. That can be interpreted much like a confidence interval. It's calculated in a different way than that. Um, different arguments about why this is called a caterpillar plot. I thought a good one would be that um, people often interpret these things as actual the effect or the cause of the schools. And really to do that, you probably are a caterpillar smoking from a hookah as in this plot from, uh, from, from Alice in Wonderland. The quote actually is from, from the queen, but she describes how sometimes she believes as many as six impossible things before breakfast. So a caterpillar who's smoking from a hookah could be believed that these estimates, despite just coming from a normal, normal regression, and actually um, my, my uh, pandemic um, coffee holder is this book, which is actually a cute little book showing all sorts of things where correlations do not imply causation. Um, but we have the caterpillar can think that. An alternative, alternative reason for that name is that it, some people think it looks a little bit like a caterpillar. Okay, so um, how are we gonna do these simulations and how does it work? How, does, how do governments create policies? And it's something that as a researcher, you have to get into a different mind frame for how these algorithms are going to have to work for within government policy. One big difference is that if I say I want to use this particular regression, this particular method, I have to go and use that. So it's like pre-registration on steroids. The reason why you can't say, oh, I didn't realize how skewed this variable was, I'm going to now use the Wilcoxon rather than the t-test or something like that, is that you've got to use the same procedure every year or it's not fair to those individual units that you're either grading or you're allocating money to or things like that. So you really have to make sure that your procedure works each time, works in the same way. Um, and that's an important issue for that. Um, one thing I also learned is that when you're describing the horrible errors that you have in some of these algorithms that you may find, you don't describe them as errors or concerns nor problems. You describe them as considerations and that there's opportunities to, for improving some aspects of that. Um, and, and that's because you really don't want to sit there and have press pick up that there was an error in what you did two, two years ago and have that cause some sort of legal problems with that. Um, and so there's a lot of issues with that. Okay. Um, Somebody put, I'm just quickly checking the chat. I assume all of you can check the chat. There's things, um, scream out of it something that, that you want me to answer. Okay, so a couple of things I learned while I worked in government. Um, how governments decide these different things varies a lot. So if you're in some sort of unit that has a long history of needing statistical things done. So for like a lot of the medical ones where it's been decades and decades where statistics has been used for these things, um, you probably have biostatisticians on board with a lot of experience, but still there's going to be a lot of variability in what 
in their expertise. And also what I found is um, it's not like within academia where you really keep up to date on a lot of these things because you really have to. If you don't, reviewers will point out that you haven't taken into account what was published last month uh, for some procedure and that you would want to go and try that. Um, so we have a lot of advantages in academia that you don't have really the time to keep up with everything when you're working in a lot of government things. Also, a lot of non-statistical issues are important. Um, I'd like people to list what things I think might be important for policymakers and politicians that might not be as important for for researchers. I'm saying, well, if we had unlimited funds, then we could do a lot of stuff. And um, the, well, as policymakers, they've got a budget to keep to. I'm not sure. Yeah, the the one aspect with the budgets is the budgets are usually more frigid in that they're decided in policy by in the previous year, and you might not suddenly have tons more. Um, that said, usually there's more money for these things in in government than there is in in so research unless it's built into it. Um, so that you'll have, if, if I want to do a study and I'm working in government, I can usually grab a few people to come and work for me because they'll find it more interesting than the boring tasks they're, they've been assigned to. Uh, whereas in, in academia, that's a lot tougher because um, you know, there aren't people with that sort of freedom with that. Uh, there are time issues though for in for a lot of policymakers, so um, you know, we take this example with the schools. You get in the U.S. You get the standardized test scores from the big testing companies, maybe two weeks before school starts, and they think um, you know, and and that's there for lots of reasons that they have for checking the you know validity, the you know reliability, and the fairness of the scores. But it means that the states will be getting these data in and may have you know, a week to get all these analysis done. And still those grades are gonna be going out to the schools, perhaps the second week of school, just in time for all the parents to complain. Um, so that's good. Now in, in I, I should say also looking at the screen there with, with Ollie's screen today in the US is National Bring Your Cat to Work Day. So um, if anybody has cats on their screen, they're certainly allowed to show them on, on that. Okay, so let's, let's go back to uh, what I've got here. One of the things that is important is it's got to allow the politicians to stay electable. So it's got to seem fairly fair and that's important. So they don't want to piss off in this case, the, the parents or the teachers union, probably. Some politicians will want to piss off the teaching union because that may be something that their, their base of support wants, but they certainly don't want to piss off the parents. Um, transparent, I've put there with a question mark. Lots of them argue that what we should have is something really transparent so that the teachers, the parents, the principals can all understand what's going on when we describe it to them. Uh, you know, there's the difficulty with transparency that people can figure out what you're doing. Now, from a research standpoint, you, you must be saying, but isn't that what we're told in all this reproducibility stuff and things like that? Yes, that's really what we should be doing. Uh, but if people figure out exactly what these things are, there's the worry that they could go and figure out it, it takes away some of the flexibility of the of things like bonus points that exist in some of these things, which are not there for good reason. So we should be transparent, but there's people who fear that transparency. There's also the idea that the algorithm should be fairly clear to people, and they're often sold by consultants who say, oh, let's use this magical, um, what would be called sort of a few years ago, a long statistical term or then artificial intelligence or AI or um, ML, which you know, now means machine learning. So they use these, lo these long things to hide what was really going on with that. And we see that in, in, in the research space also. Um, 
We get a, get a lot of different statisticians within these places will vary in, in what they know in the education sector and in a lot of others, but um, you know, like in, 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 in the home office in, 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 in the UK, they'll have people there who've been doing national stats, but not a lot of the predictive stats for criminology until the last decade or so. And in sort of education, we have decades of experience of having lots of people doing the item measurement within test construction, but we don't have a lot of the other people who've been doing accountability for lots and lots of years. And so that means you don't have the experience there. You don't have all the PhD people going into that. You're often relying on educational consultants who are often not statisticians. So the examples that I'll be giving, giving today are both ones that they got from educational consultants who said these were good things and that's often not always the right thing. Um, one final bit that I learned is that it's really complicated to fix things. Um, that's in part because these algorithms are often agreed upon by uh, political committees who have it explained to them in terms that are usually highly inaccurate. Uh, but they have these things that they've agreed upon. So in changing them, ideally you want to change it so it looks like you're just tweaking something a little bit. Um, but that's something that um, I'll, I'll mention a little bit more later. Okay, so the first example I'm going to take comes from uh, trying to measure graduation growth. And this is part of a lot of the education systems where they try to measure school a bit school effectiveness or school league tables. So the example, the, the two examples I'll give, the, the first one's from New Mexico. Uh, the, the second one is from lots of different states and countries, uh, including you know, what was going on in New Mexico. New Mexico, if, not, if, if you've never been there, is a beautiful state. So where I was was in Santa Fe, which is the capital. It's, a, it's over 2,000 meters high up in the edge of the, of the lower part of the Rocky Mountains and the high desert. And so you've got cactus and pine trees, beautiful area, big artist, artist area. It's also, the state has one of the worst education systems in the US. So it's, it's got some, some real issues there. It also has the school district with the most PhD student, with the most PhD people in it. So it includes a number of the different government headquarters, including Los Alamos, which is, you know, if, if you've studied the atomic bomb or studied any of the, um, like, you know, so, so lots of the physics things, a lot of the physicists in the US live in Los Alamos. So it's a different sort of area. And when I was brought in to look at this, uh, I was given this headline that the, the system that was used there they went and showed to the rocket scientists and they decided that the system was too complex for the rocket scientists. And by complex, I don't mean mathematical rigor. I mean, it had just too many tweaks in it to try to understand the documentation for it. So it was clear, clearly failing at the transparency thing on that. And these, um, you know, these people had difficulties with that. So school grades, um, they measure both graduation rate and graduation growth. So they have the, the graduation rate is pretty simple. They were looking at three, the, the previous three years, figuring you don't really want to penalize people for what went on before three years before that. But you also don't want to use the most recent year because some of these schools are fairly small. We had, um, we had, we had some elementary schools with 10 people in them. The high schools will tend to have more, but still if you only have 20 or 30 people, or if you only have 20 people graduating each year, that's not a, a very reliable number. So they had three years and they wanted also to look at growth. So they, they wanted to say, well, the school was getting better. We want to reward that they're, they're doing something well with that. Uh, and they put various tweaks in so that if you're measuring these separately, you don't penalize a school that's essentially at ceiling. And if you penalize those schools, those schools are the ones that complain absolutely tons. Um, so that you know, they, they tend for good or bad reasons, mostly bad reasons, people tend to do things to try to limit their number of complaints from the groups that complain a lot. 
So what I had suggested to them was just a simple way where you have, you take a weighted average of those three years and you give higher weights to the more recent years and you can create whatever sort of systems that they were having there. Uh, this would be a nice transparent way to do it. Um, but they said they have to, because of the, the legislation, have graduation rate and graduation growth rate separately. So first question is how might you measure growth? I'm going to uh, just sort of pose this for people to speak out loud just because we weren't getting lots of people on the jam board last time. How might you measure growth? Just yell out so I, I can't see hands. Time series? Pardon? Time series? Yeah, you could use a time series one. Can, can you be more explicit? How would you use the time series? Uh, so you'd see if there was a trend in, an upward trend in number of graduations over time per year, I suppose, or something along those lines. And um, you'd expect that schools that had uh, more graduations in year one would have also have more in year two because of like you expect the quality of the school to change that'd be kind of autocorrelated as well. That'd be my guess. Yeah, so and so the, this trend or the slope. Oh, sorry. Ah. The, the, those are not technological difficulties. Those are human difficulties I, I just showed. Um, so you know, a simple way to do this is just the, the rate at time three minus the rate at time two divided by two. So the slope between that. And you can put in things that some schools would not have a rate one year or they would be a new school. You can put in tweaks for that or you can do, you can do things to, to deal with the fact that these are proportions um, if, 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 if you wanted. Um, but what they had done is they had used a the conditional modes from a random slope model. So this is the very first example if you type question mark LMER, or if you type example, um, in parentheses LMER, you get this example. So it shows a random slope model. <clears throat> and so it's something that's taught in week two of most multi-level modeling courses. So you talk about how to get a random intercept and then a random slope. And the, um, this is one way to do those, to do the time series models with that. You can also do these um, with structural equation models. So you can get them. So for a model like this, you would get exactly the same. You, it would lead to the exact same conclusions for it. So this is what they had done. Um, any considerations rather than problems or errors or issues that people might see with this. And this is kind of tricky because it, given the people at LM, you know, who wrote LMER and the people who write a lot of these multi-level modeling things describe the random slopes models and describe things with examples that work. The issue here is that with only three data points, anytime you have any complex model, so anything beyond least squares, you should always get worried that you may be near near the limits of where you're going to get reliable estimates. And so with only three data points and some values missing, but this the um, in, in the paper, the main simulations work without any missing and show the same problems. With only three, you may not be getting reliable answers for this. And so here's, um, that's the method they had in place when I came in and looked at it. And here are some data from different schools. They were given up to four points for graduation growth rate where four is good. So a school going from 100 to 93 to 83 got 3.31, so a really good score. You know, the conditional modes, these were, these, these were just scaled values of the conditional modes. So um, if you're above two, you're above the, the center. Um, so it's going down by about 10 points each year, but it has a really high score. Whereas the first school after the vertical dots goes from five to 14 to 10 and a 12 to 12 to 16, and they're getting tiny growth values. So showing the values just are not working 
it's showing this algorithm is just not working. And so by presenting this table and presenting this table with fewer than eight values, uh, but then saying how many of the, val of the schools down at the bottom were actually made appeals, so we're creating problems for it. This was a good way to convince the Secretary of State that there was an issue or there was a consideration with it. Um, we actually, when we were just meeting the, the, the sort of two of us and, 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 and the other deputy directors, we could, um, we could be a little bit more specific in, in, in our word choice. Okay, so what's happening? Here's the uh, conditional mean intercept and the conditional mean slope. Because there's not that much data within each of these groups, it's not able to actually give a unique estimate for both of those values for each of the schools. So what it's doing is it's basically just taking the intercept for these and giving a, um, the, the conditional mode for the slope both has a fairly small standard deviation, but also is basically just measuring the, is just measuring the intercept. If we compare it with the ordinary least square slope, which will be R, the third R minus the first star divided by two with, with a few extra fancy things if you only have, um, if, if, if you don't have one of those two endpoints um, and you get that from the equation above there, here's what it's showing. There's basically no relationship <coughs> between, <coughs> sorry, between the conditional mean um, for the slope uh, <clears throat> and the ordinary least squares estimate of the slope. Okay, so one of the questions that we had is how often does this occur for, for a data set like this? Um, and so we can think of a few different ways to do, to do simulation. One is that we can think how the data may arise. And in the second example, that's what we're going to do. That's a bit more typical when people talk about simulation. When people talk about simulation in most circumstances, what they mean, they have some data model in mind, they create data for it with some variability for a few of the, of the different variables. And they see what sort of statistical values come out of different procedures. The second way is to sample from the existing data. So usually people talk about a bootstrap for this, um, but you can use this to say for data like this, where we don't really know what's, what the mechanism was that gave rise to, to these data. Um, if, if you go to that, that paper, there are a few methods that, you, that are shown that are, are reasonable for what, how those data may have arisen. But a much simpler way is to say, look at the existing data and take bootstrap samples of these data and see what the estimates are. So again, you can come up with data models for it. You may think it's binomial. It's probably not perfectly binomial, the data. Um, but again, it's going to be simpler to go and to actually just create, just to create individual bootstrap samples for it. Um, so this is the data set that was used for it. It's in the OSF, um, OSF directory. I can put it in the chat if that's useful for people. Actually, given my technological skills, if, if somebody else wants to put it in there, that might be a better bet. Um, so it's got, as is typical with lots of things when you're reading CSV files, for, for, for those of you who, work mostly within academic settings and you get different data sets that are either in SPSS or R or some sort of some sort of format like that. Most often when you're working outside of academia, you get things in Excel files and you save them as CSV just so you get rid of some of the oddities in it. One oddity that will likely show up is how the how the missing strings are. So in um in R the the capital letters NA are used pretty universally for that. That's not true outside of R. Um, so you need to deal with that on it. And here is a, um, a big scary looking function for sampling from that data set, running the analysis with both getting the slope 
using the ordinary least squares method and the random slope method, and then looking at the correlation for each one of those individual bootstrap samples. <coughs> and then at the end, it, it, sorry. And, and then at the end, it goes through and does a correlation of it. So one thing I want to stress here is when you're doing simulations with multi-level data, you need to be particularly careful about what your elements that you're bootstrapping are. So which things you're repeating with that. You usually want to be, for an example like this, sampling the schools at random. So you need to have the data in a wide format. So you sample school one, school three, school four, school one, school eight, school four, school, you know, in that sort of way, rather than sampling the individual years for each one. And so that's something that's important to do for it. For multi-level models, we need to reshape the data so that it's in a long format. Um, we also need to create a school code that's unique for each one of those new bootstrap elements in it. And so that's what we're doing with those first four lines with that. Um, I just changed the name to rate there. Um, you can have it as, as whatever you want. I just thought rate was a good name for that. The ordinary least squares estimates then is basically just doing a, you know, is predicting the rate from the school code treated as a fixed variable and a fixed variable for the school code multiplied by year. So dummy variables for each of those. And so you're getting a lot of different, um, a lot of different values for that, which means you need a fairly large data set. Um, it, it also means interpreting the individual ones are, are pretty difficult. Um, whereas with the random slopes model, the actual model is much simpler because you're only estimating a single, a sort of single intercept, a single slope, and then the variation around those. And we know that for most purposes, when you have enough data, it's better to use the random approach. You tend to get better estimates using Tukey's phrase, you borrow strength from the other schools to get to improve your own estimates. And this is particularly useful when there are schools with very few people. The argument to policymakers is, well, you're penalizing schools with very few people who do really well. Um, and, and that's an issue that they, they have. Um, so sometimes you do put things in to those, in, into the algorithms that says, let's check for that. And they would have done much higher to give them the higher score with that, even though you know it's less accurate. Okay, so what I'd like people to do is to go through and and actually do this. So if they can, if people have R open, they can just send this in, change the seed so that each of you gets a different histogram. And also I should stress one thing when writing code for policymakers, it's useful to make sure it's all documented well so that you can explain things to people in it's also usually the case that if you're doing something one year, you're probably not doing it the next year. So you need to have it well documented for the people who will be doing it the next year. Um, and those are usually more important considerations than how fast the algorithm is going to run. Given that typically it takes days to write the code to do something, and even with grossly inefficient code, it may take, you know, you may have to run something overnight, uh, but you're not there sitting there doing things with it. Um, people can speed code up in various ways that makes it less transparent and less easy to find problems. And so uh, lots of people much wiser than me have, have stressed that, um, yeah, if you're doing something where it's gonna be running a billion times, make it as efficient as possible. Or if you're doing something that will take three years to run, speed it up, but um, for a lot of situations, that's not the case. So I, I have this slide up just so there's people, if there's questions, considerations, any other improvements that they would see for that code. Oh, do I have a clearer version? Um, <clears throat> 
Yes. Let me. Um... I, I copied and pasted it from your OSF page, and it's taken all the all the spaces out and all the new lines. So <laughs> it's just like this horrible block, which probably won't run. I just wondered if you had like a, a formatted version. Yeah. Let me get to the um, to the formatted version. I think I think I found it. That's better. Done it. I I Oh you've just done that. Okay, great. And I'll I'll put two two options now. Thanks. I should say these are in, in Notepad plus plus, but that has that saves things in R and color codes things correctly in R. I saw that R Studio was 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 another sort of recommendation for people doing this. So I I've created the slides in R Studio. Um, I don't know how many people use R Studio for making their slides or any latex editor for that matter for it, but um, for this particular thing it, it would mean I'd be able I could press buttons and it will actually run and create the output. But uh, for most talks, that's not a huge advantage. So for people who have been on some of the other, other webinars, I list here the number of runs at 100 just to save time. What sort of numbers are would be useful for most simulations? I see the kind of head nodding of it 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 depends, which is the correct answer. The fewest I've used is 10. In a, in a in in a published paper, so that was back in 1997, and I could have still run more even back in 1997, but it was an example where I just wanted to show that um, the value that I got was not hugely weird for a particular situation, and so I ran 10, and it was right in the middle of those, so. Oh, and you'll need to have um, have have sort of LME four loaded for this to work. If anybody's getting that error, yeah, I'm going to I think make the decision that. This is taking a little bit longer than I had hoped. Um, so what I'm going to do is show what they would be. I got a kind of bimodal distribution. Great. Um, something like that. Oh, I uh, can't see. Hasn't, your screen hasn't updated, I don't think. Well, Yeah, some, yeah, just like that. Yeah, so you've got some some negatives and some some positives. So basically, what what it comes out to with these data is it's kind of a flip of the coin whether it's accurate or not. And that was the that's the metaphor that I gave the Secretary of State, which he was not pleased with, since that tells her how bad it was before. But that um, she's no longer the Secretary of State there anyway, so that's that's okay. Uh, but what what happens with a fair number of complex models is that when they work, they work slightly better than the, the OLS one. 
where when they don't work, they, they don't work and they don't work in lots of different ways. Here, the correlation being, being near zero shows it's really not working. And so the, the statistical message from this is that when you have a fairly small number and we did the simulations with four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, a few other numbers. But when you have less than six or, or so, you're gonna tend to get situations where sometimes it doesn't work. And in those situations, you should run both. And if you get something similar, you're probably pretty safe with the conditional modes. When you get something that's really different, you should stick with the, uh, with the least squares estimates because they don't have a lot of the same types of computational problems of this. Okay, so the next example creates data, which is more complex creating the data, but it means that um, we don't have the problem of reading in the data, which is I think what slowed us down here. Um, so the main aspect of most of the school grading procedures, and these are also used in the US for teachers, for principals, used in hospitals for grading hospitals, used in police forces for grading, how well the police forces are doing, lots of different things. They're called value added models. They're, what was used in the US before that was ones where um, they just looked at how, what the overall grades of the kids were at the end. And they realize, well, that's not fair because if you're at a school that has kids that are that arrive with really high scores, it's really easy to keep them at really high scores. What you should be looking at is some advantage. So the value added models were used for that. Um, there's a lot of different issues with them. There's a lot of different issues with using accountability in general for these things. Um, here, I'm just going to talk about one problem in particular that we use that I think worked well with, with simulation to show where there can be problems with it. But there's a lot of issues with it, like uh, the basic value added model being biased for, uh, for schools and teachers that tend to have, um, that teach groups of kids who are from high performing groups. So there's a lot of biases with that. Um, so let's look at this. Uh, what do the policymakers believe? Well, they've been sold these things by people who they pay money to. And we know from uh, a lot of different psychology things, if you pay money to somebody to do something, you better believe that they're correct. And you tend to believe that they're correct and you trust them. So people have developed some magical thinking, according to Henry Braun for this, that these magical, uh, fancy statistical algorithms that people use. And like the people at SAS, who are some of the people who do a lot of this, you know, they won't even release what their algorithms are because they say it's proprietary. Um, and so you're completely at their mercy to say that here's some sort of magical thing. You put all the numbers in and you get these caterpillar plots out. Here's an example of a caterpillar plot I made that um, takes a little bit more to make than just that one line of code that I have. And again, the smoking caterpillar believes that the differences between these different lines relates to some sort of causal or effectiveness of it. Um, one thing at least that's a plus with these is they do include those bars there. So at least they tell you that for a lot of the schools in, in the middle, it's really difficult to differentiate them at, at all. Okay, so it's magical thinking. Do we really believe it's magical thinking? Well, they may, but Harvey Goldstein here says it's certainly not a magic wand that will allow us automatically to make definitive pronouncements about differences between individual schools. Uh, so he's been very clear about that. This goes back 20, this goes back 20, this goes back 30 years. Um, I can just do, do subtraction even after just one copy. Uh, this goes back 30 years. He'd been doing this sort of work He's one of the main people who's, who developed these methods back in the 1980s and 1990s. And he's been critical of them for this use really since the beginning. So a um, hallmark paper by him and David Spiegelhalter, who particularly for those of you in the UK, you will read what he's been writing in The Guardian and other places about, the, about COVID. 
Uh, for those of you who do stuff with Bayesian stuff, you, you certainly know both of these people for that. Um, so they've been critical um, of this sort of approach for it. <clears throat> so for this example, we're going to make data. So when we make data, we need to have some sort of knowledge about how some variables relate to each other. So we usually construct a data model, which in modern terminology often gets called a directed acyclic graph. Graph just means that there's nodes that are connected by uh, edges. Uh, the directed means that there's arrows on one edges of those, which we interpret in the science world as causes. And the acyclic means that there's no recursive ones in that. And this is the type of data model that is fundamental for people who are trying to establish causation in things. So Judea Pearl, one of the main people on this. So we'll start with, um, there'll be a lot of school and neighborhood unknowns. So things like the demographics of the general area that will influence the school effectiveness through things like who, the types of students going to school there, the money that's coming in and a lot of other issues. We know particularly in sort of US that the zip code or postcode to translate it into British um, that you live in is a very good predictor of how good the school is likely to be and how much money is spent at the school. We also know that there's person and family variables, genetic variables that relate to how good you are going to be on these different tests. So we have the school will affect the school effectiveness. It will also affect the pre-scores through previous schooling. The person variables will affect both of the test scores. Um, the main thing that we want to measure is the school effectiveness, which is how much the school affects the post scores. So that's why I've drawn that in red. Um, pre versus pre predicting post. If you want to get picky with this, you can say that actually the person family unknowns is predicting the latent variable that predicts both of those. Um, how well the latent variable sort of measures that if it's pretty close to one, and it becomes the same as this model. Okay, so this is a really, really simple, oversimplistic model, but one thing that's worth doing, <coughs> sorry, is checking to see that your statistical algorithm was work for really simple models before you build them up into more complex models. So what we'd want to know is what sort of values we would have that would be connecting schools to school effectiveness, school to pre, the person variables to pre and to post. So here's some code. Now this code should, uh, it's not reading in any data. So this should just, if you, and, and it's, I sent it around in the chat. Let me resend it around in the chat. this creates a function. And what this function does is it reads in the, the values for those six arrows, those different weights. And it goes and it calculates the, the correlation um, between the true effectiveness scores. So because this is a simulation, we can say how big that effect is, what you put in for the school to post score with how it's estimated as the conditional mode, which is the, the penultimate line there. And then it just runs the correlation between those two. And we can use things other than the correlation if we want, uh, but the, the, the correlation is a fairly simple one for it. So that should just run in your session in R. You got negative, negative 0.3, but, but all those all those policymakers say that this is this is the best thing they've got. This is wonderful. What kind of bizarre numbers did you put in there, Ollie? C to 330. We'll see what happens if I change the seed. This is 
now I'm on negative 0.4, so uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, and so what happens with this is I, I just chose some numbers which um, these aren't anything special here. Um, so uh, you can put in different numbers. Sometimes you, you'll put in things where the numbers create a problem that won't work. Um, so, it won't, you know, so if you send things out at extremes, you'll get some computational problems. But these are ones where you've got the, the sort of family effects are bigger than the neighborhood effects, which you'd kind of expect because we know the the family environment and the the, the genes are important. Um, I've listed pre to post as seven to the pi because it doesn't matter because we're conditioning on it. So you can put it at any number you want there and you'll get the same thing. So when, when I've run this and asked people to, to sort of give me numbers, but before I press enter, I ask them what things they expect from it. And you get really different answers from different people. So I presented it to um, the people at Stata, that, that software company. And the head of that said uh, he was pretty close. Um, and you know, he, he, he identified what, what was happening with that. But here with these examples, with this example, you get a negative value. So this is something that is a really problematic. These are not bizarre numbers. And what you can do is you can put in lots of different values and figure out what's going on with this when you get really bad values. But first I wanna go through why this might be causing a problem. Um, I'm gonna talk about the concept of colliders here and talk a little bit about Judea Pearl's um, discussion of it. And Judea Pearl, his book Causality has been listed as one of the big books in science for thus far in this century. Um, but it's not the easiest read. The easiest read is probably the appendix to that. And that's also, it's also on the web is a talk he gave about about causation at UCLA. Um, so it gives a, a nice, a much better background. So if you're reading Pearl, read the appendix first and then go and start on the book. That's, my, that's, that's the biggest Pearl advice I can have. Okay, so smoking and child mortality. So if a mother smokes, it's believed that there's an effect on infant mortality and it's pretty, clear that if you smoke more, the infant mortality goes up. And that has been found in lots and lots of different studies. But what tends to happen in, in lots of different disciplines, including, including psychology, if you have something measured, you think, oh, I've got several things measured, I should put them all into the regression and then look at the individual coefficients, because if I put more things in, I get closer to causality. And again, that's something our smoking caterpillar believes but really the rest of us should not. So what happened when some of the medical people did this? They took the weight of the infant and they conditioned upon that. So they put these two things in there. And then what they got was a negative relationship between smoking and mortality. So they got that smoking was, appeared to be something that was good for mortality. So if you smoke more, your child had a better chance to live after you condition upon the weight. And again, so there's some people out there who believe that um, the more things you put into a, a, a regression, the better it is. And the more you can look and say that there's some sort of causal relationship there. The issue here is there's a whole lot of other things that affect the weight of a child and affect the mortality rate of the child. And a lot of these are much more problematic for the mortality of the child. So that if you have some of these genetic disorders where they affect weight somewhat, but not, you know, they may not affect weight that much, but they affect infant mortality a lot. If you're comparing other, if you're comparing two children who weigh a bit less than average, one of whom is due to one of these, uh, is 
to, to due to the mother smoking and the other is due to one of these other causes, it'll look like the smoking is helpful because you're comparing it to kids who have these other issues that are influencing the weight and influencing the mortality much more. So this is called a collider. So in, um, in Pearl, uh, I don't know the page there, but I, I cite this enough, I should know it's around 120. Uh, he lists three different ways in which three variables can be related. A chain, X leads to Y leads to Z, or leads to Z, for, for, for those of you on that side of the pond. Fork, where X is influenced by Y and Y influences Z. And a collider, where both X and Z influence, influence Y. <clears throat> he describes two rules. When you're looking at different paths, it's important to know whether the path is blocked or unblocked. If it's blocked, it means information cannot flow along it. If it's unblocked, it means information can flow upon it. So for a path to be blocked, according to rule one, the path must contain a chain or a fork in which the metal variable is Y and where Y is then conditioned upon. So if you condition upon Y, so including that in your regression equation, that will block the chain and block the fork. The second rule is that the path of the collider should not include a variable that is conditioned upon. So a collider begins blocked. So if the way I like to think about a, a, a collider is if you have two, if you have two tributaries of it's a river going towards a very deep well, that well being why the water just flows down them and doesn't mix with each other. But if you condition upon it, it's like filling in that well with cement and now the water does flow across the two. So a collider begins blocked, but when you condition upon it, it, it goes to unblocked. So here we have looking at school effectiveness, there's one backdoor path so what we're interested in is measuring that direct path, this one between school effectiveness and posts. There's one backdoor path that goes school effectiveness to the neighborhoods to pre to post. <coughs> now pre is what we're conditioning upon and it's in the middle of a chain. So that should block that path, that's good. For this path though, that we go school effectiveness to neighborhood to pre to person to post, now pre is a collider. So blocking that means that we've unblocked that path. So conditioning upon that means we've unblocked the path, which means that we're going to have more difficulty measuring the direct effect of school effectiveness. And here's what we find here. I had a student once ask me if that was me right. Uh, I wasn't sure whether I should give them extra points for thinking I'm that intelligent to have written something as important as Sewell Wright had written or to lower their marks because I'm really not that old. Um, but one of the things Sewell Wright talks about is the, the product of the paths uh, being an important issue with that. And here what we do is if we put in tons of different values for all those different six things, if we multiply the four backdoor paths together, we get a measure of how problematic that backdoor path will be when it's unblocked. And we see that as that product goes up, the correlations go down and can go down really, really dramatically, particularly when the true school effectiveness effect is fairly small. And we expect the, tr the true school effectiveness score to be pretty small. So while it has an effect and it has an important effect, and small effects are important, particularly as they go over years and years and years within a school, we expect the individual effect for any one year, for any one teacher to be relatively small. So this does not bode well for this method. Okay, just as a quick word for, for this, um, we tend to get a gain score method tends to work a little bit better in this situation, but has its own problems. Pearl also explains why the gain score method works in it. Um, but one of the issues in trying to explain Pearl, his rules of what's 
uh, what's blocking, what's unblocking, is that it's often difficult for people to follow that sort of logic. And it's easier to have them actually put in these numbers and see what sorts of things they come up with. Um, so that's one of the reasons why simulation in this situation works really well. So I was able to sit there and say, you put, you know, telling the policymakers for them to put in the numbers. And then also saying, saying, well, if you want to add more things to those models, make them more sort of realistic, say what to put in that we won't be, we weren't able to do in real time, but we could come back the next day and say, well, here's some simulations for that. You now put in some numbers and see what you get for that. So the simulations are a useful thing and that people can see what actually is happening with that. Okay, I'm gonna hit the summary now. Um, first is a sort of stats conclusion. Um, this is from a few years ago from Morgan Winsip in their, in their book about causation. And they're talking about here the, the problems with colliders and with including lots and lots of different things in both structural equation models and in graphs in general. And they point out that, um, I mean, they're, they're actually arguing here that not all the problems in sociology were due to this, but certainly a lot of them were. Um, and that's when we include everything in the models. We're creating lots more problems than we're probably fixing. So in the psychology world, Paul Mel wrote about this in 1971, I believe. Danny Kahneman wrote about it about the same time, talking about all the problems when you run analysis of covariance and that it's really not controlling for anything. So the word control in that context, I think we should take out of the vocabulary because it's not controlling. And you ask people, what's a controlling? Well, it's not. You're conditioning on something. You're looking at conditional associations. You're not magically making causations out of anything. Um, and you're certainly not controlling physically, at, at moving physically, doing something with any of those variables. So it's important not to use that word incorrectly in these things. Um, why do are we in this problem uh, that we get a lot of these algorithms get, get used and people believe them? Well, one is um, things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. They have such a feel about them that people who don't know what they're like believe that they must be correct because they have these really complex sounding names. People believe them. And once you believe something, it's, diff it's difficult to change people's beliefs on it. So I'd be sitting there with saying things like, here is the actual data from this year. Here's all these problems. Here's what would have happened. And people still thinking, but there must be something wrong with what you've done rather than no, these are your actual data. These are what's happened with that than what they had signed up with before. And that's because once you have a belief, it's difficult to change that. And in, um, in, in, in the UK, you've seen that with some of the Brexit things that <clears throat> you know, people with certain beliefs about that will still believe, be believing it. With COVID, some of the misinformation that goes on with it. Here in, in, in the sort of US, we have the examples of people believing that the election was stolen due to space rays from different places coming down and changing votes and things, and people really believing those things, and it's difficult to change their beliefs on it. I don't want to pin the blame though on the, those people's beliefs. A lot of this has to do with what statisticians have been saying. <clears throat> Phrases like maximum likelihood. So we had an ML before you know, the machine learning folks or a, so another word for the conditional means is the best linear unbiased estimate. These make it sound like what we're giving people are accurate, are you know, unfallible estimates. We call things significant. I mean, that we all know is a horrible word that has now become um, used so commonly and has been for 50 years, um, but it's an unfortunate word in that there perhaps are some contexts where it may be useful, but not in 98% of the contexts. So it's important when you're talking to people who are not stats people, but even when you're talking to stats people to make sure you don't oversell things uh, this is a particular issue I, I see with consultants who get paid money to try to convince people to do what they're doing, um, often say how good what their particular algorithms are. 
Um, I should say academics are much better at saying that sort of other people's algorithms are bad, but at least that's a step forward. Um, the example value added models is, is another in that you're describing what you hope they, they do rather than what they do. Ways to convince people. Um, one thing that I was taught was it should fit on one page what you're handing to pretty top policymakers. So you go from a long sort of document to convince your, your team that here there's a real problem. And this would be the sort of thing you hand to other academics. But for policymakers, that's not going to work. Um, you need to have a single page, a single thing of what you want to do instead. A table or a plot is really useful, often both. Use color, take advantage where you can of all these things to make it as clear as possible. If it's already implemented, you can show errors. And that you know, is an incredibly useful thing because people can then see, ah, oh, this is what's happening. It does also make them realize, oh, we've got an issue then because of it's already been implemented and there's already problems um, changing. It's going to, to create more problems, but may save, you know, it, it can still be good because it can save more problems in the future. Um, make the explanation simple, but don't make it over simple. These are intelligent people, uh, but you don't use language that they're not going to know about. Um, they already think you're a nerd. And that's an important thing to realize. They're already putting too much trust in what you're saying as a data person than what you as a data person have. So fortunately, most of us will already be um, skeptical enough of any statistics that come out of any output that we have. We don't look at anything and think, oh, that shows X. You know, we think, okay, what does this show? It may show something similar to X, or you know, it's not showing that X doesn't occur, but we're more skeptical in general of statistical things than most people. Okay, let me um, finish at that point. <coughs> I should stress also, there's lots and lots of other uses of simulation. One of the um, big advantages I, I've seen for simulation for these types of things is as an explanatory tool to say, here's how the data may arise, create data how you think may, may arise, and let's see how it will work with the algorithms that you have. Um, doing that before you actually go and get in trouble, actually doing, actually running these algorithms seems to me as an academic, a you know, non-brainer. You know, of course, you'd want to do that. Convincing other people for doing that um, can be a little bit trickier. And it's often because of trusting what happens in these things with knowing that there may not be an alternative. So it's important to always have an alternative for that. Um, this was more monologue than I was planning. So if people want to have some discussion or questions, I would love to answer questions that people have. I, I, I see one hand. Yeah, um, no, I thought I'd, uh, I'd kick off with a, with a question. Um, I was wondering how you might um, investigate sort of social biases using simulations and these sorts of things, because what was found like in the COVID thing last year was that children from uh, like lower social economic classes and things like that were being downgraded because of where they were. Is there a way you can account for that using the simulations that you've been using? Or at least explore it, explore it as a possibility. Yeah, so I mean, I, I um, you know, I, I think a lot of us had at the first couple of months of the COVID pandemic suddenly became biostatisticians. I didn't do any simulations with that. I was, I was basically just helping friends out, you know, trying to predict how many hospitals were going to be in trouble with employment. Um, but what we've done with, within this context is we've looked at schools that have, have um, more kids from groups that are historically low performing. So in the US that is <clears throat> um, sort of mainly sort of ethnic differences, socioeconomic differences and things like English language learners. You know, we know those groups. 
So what you can do then is, is put it in the groups. You can define your schools with various variables for that. So we define the school, we, we define both the, the individual person and the school variables, and you can set those up in various ways. So we have things with those where, um, where, where, where the schools would have say 80% from these groups. And it depended how they came about to have those groups, whether it would be a problem for these methods or not. If they had these, these kids because of a testing mechanism to stream people into these schools, then that created one problem. If it was based on just where people lived, it created a different problem and different algorithms performed optimally for those two situations. Um, so you can put those things in. One of the key things though is how you put them in. So, so, so with that example, the allocation mechanism into schools became the, became the critical thing, not just how the schools were composed. So when uh, we were telling people that that's a difficult thing to, to tell policymakers, so we had to come up with examples. And the example we, we use is a baseball example. I'll translate that into, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll translate that into football soccer since that's more easily understood. Um, if, if you have, after the first couple of games of, of the Euros, you're trying to predict how many goals somebody's going to score and you get somebody from a country that doesn't usually score many and that person scores two goals versus somebody from a country that scores a lot also scores two goals and you're predicting how many goals will they score for the next three games. Um, you should predict that the person from the country that usually scores a lot will continue scoring more because they're because that's about where you might expect them to be, whereas this person has scored higher than you would have expected. So you'll expect both people to regress towards the means of their groups using Galton's term, or I guess Galton's terminology was regress towards mediocrity. But you know, so nowadays if we if we regress towards towards the center of, of those groups, um, then you would get a difference on that. And that would be how we could explain why you would get with an analysis of covariance approach or what's described here is the value added model approach why you'd get that happening as opposed to a gain score method which will work okay in that situation but won't work if you're if you're doing streaming where you're actually assigning people to groups based on how well they've done are there any other questions at all in the in the group No, I think we we seem to be done. So thank, thanks, Christopher. Well, I guess um, if there are no other questions, um, we'll we'll call it there. Uh, thank you so much, Dan. It's really uh, interesting presentation about uh, about simulations and like uh, your particularly your your applied use and uh, sort of policy in the United States. It's really really fascinating. Um, everything. This video is going to be made available on YouTube. Um, and that will be in the next brief couple of couple of hours or so. Um, and if you have any questions, I think just uh, reach out. And uh, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay. And I, I should say, I think I do. I list. Uh, I will put my email here. Okay. So if anybody has questions, feel free to email me. I'll put my the email that I read most often here. Thank you very much. Yep. Right, I'll stop the recording now. Uh...